Construction Champions, it's your host, Ron Nussbaum, and we're here for another amazing episode of Construction Champions Podcast, where we're burning the house down and we're rebuilding it in less than 30 minutes. It's pretty amazing. The amount of golden nuggets and fire that gets dropped on this show twice a week, Mondays and Thursdays, sometimes blows my own mind. So, champions, I am super excited to have Bobby on the show today. How are you doing, sir? Absolutely phenomenal. Thanks for having me here, Ron. I'm excited about the topics. I'm excited about the insights. I'm excited about the event itself. So I'm looking forward to getting this thing going. Awesome, man. So why don't we kick it off with you telling the champions out there a little bit about you and what excites you right now? Oh, absolutely. So I served 12 years in the United States Marine Corps as a data data analyst. I then left the Marine Corps to study finance economics with a overarching discipline in applied entrepreneurship. And I took that skill set along with my Marine Corps background and tried my hand in several businesses. So business number one, flopped, failed. Business number two, flopped failed. Business number three, learned, went a little well, flopped, failed. Uh, And then business number four really started to take off differently. And it took off differently because I was different. Through each successive building of the business and burning down of the business, pun intended, um, I learned quite a bit. And I'm excited today about helping six-figure business owners turn their owner-operated organizations into seven figure professionally managed organizations. Mm -hmm. And that's, what's really exciting me right now, because it's a learning curve that doesn't get its due attention in my, in my perspective. I think that we give a lot of attention to the $3 million company going to seven or going to 10 million. And we give a lot of attention to the startup, but we don't give due attention to the six figure business owner right around say a quarter million, half a million. And that's just struggling to hit that seven consistently and sustainably because it is a lot like a um, catapult. Yeah. You know, you're out of that startup phase, but you're not into that seven figure phase yet. There is then. There's a lot to learn to get there. So I'm excited for the conversation today. Here's a fun fact for everybody out there is me and Bobby actually don't live far from each other. We met a week ago and uh, we're going to actually meet in person after this next week. Uh, So pretty amazing. That's how networking can affect everything you do. Here we are networking nationwide get on a call or other and find out we're less than an hour from each other. And uh, that's why you just got to be out there doing it, keeping it going. So let's get in, get into it with the million dollar question. And that is what makes a construction champion? Absolutely. I'd like to answer this question from my core discipline and study, which is finance and economics and overall business. So when I think of a construction champion, you can break this down into a few groups. And I've worked with several construction businesses and clients. So in one aspect, you have real estate construction. And in real estate, you are either wholesaling or you're flipping houses or you're renting. Those are kind of the three main revenue streams there. Um, those that are construction champions, so to speak, that are doing a lot of that breaking down, burning down and rebuilding may be in the flipping houses space where they're trying to find a distressed property or a solid property and get more value out of it. So that's one aspect. And then the other aspect of the construction space is the heavy machinery, heavy equipment space. So those guys are doing extra, what, how do you pronounce excavation stuff. Mm -hmm. They're going and they're doing things like that. They're doing a dump truck work. So that's a whole nother industry in itself, but they're still in construction or they're doing scaffolding and, and things like, like that. So what I think makes a construction champion in all of those facets, like one thing that I think is um, uniform to all of them is cost control. I think when you can control your cost, 
in a way that allows you to maximize profitability, you're oftentimes going to have a better chance at longevity and profitability than competitors. And that's something that's interesting about the construction space is that you it's not a huge barrier to entry to get started, but it's a significant barrier to entry to scale and expand, right? So getting started, you just say you need a builder's license or say you don't need to build, you just need a real estate license, or let's say you just need a ability to drive a truck. So all of those things um, could be small barriers to entry, but once you're in there, it can be a saturated space because it is such a low barrier to entry to get started. So I think that the champions in the construction space are those that get a hold of things like builder comms and can easily and more efficiently communicate with the people that they're doing business with. So if you are that business owner and you're communicating with say tenants or your company that is managing your tenants or even your structural engineers, like all of those people are being conversed with on the day-to-day -day basis. And when you can effectively communicate with them in a way that reduces cost, I mean, that spells champion to me. I love it. And I love talking about cost control. Uh, because I think we put a lot of emphasis on top line, top line, top line, and then we get down to the bottom line and we're losing money or we're breaking even. And what does it matter if you do 10, 15 million in revenue and you lose a million dollars and, uh, cost control is what starts to get to that bottom line. That's where we can really make a huge difference no matter what you're doing in top line revenue, there's stuff you can do to help trim those costs that will lead to more profitability. And I'm excited to hear what you have to say on that and how, how do we get better at that, I guess would be the best question. Absolutely. And to dive a little bit more into my expertise, I'm a CFO by trade, so to speak. So a CFO you're probably very familiar with is a chief financial officer. I do this type of work on a fractional basis, which means that I'm not a salaried CFO like you would see in your Fortune 500 company, but again, that six figure going to seven. So one of my roles is to ensure that resource allocation is being optimized. So in other words, one way to control costs is to understand the business model. And this is something that not too many construction company owners understand to the degree that I believe they should. And I'll explain this a little bit more. In certain businesses like professional services, if you are an expert or you need to be very good at doing the thing that you do, you're probably spending most of your time being that consummate construction professional. So you're not spending a ton of time trying to figure out how to build a chart of accounts, how to properly transact on things in the right accounts, and so on and so forth. So when we have a unorganized flow of expenses, we can get a untrue perspective and perception of the business. Mm -hmm. And that's where cost controls really boil down to its are you accurately inputting information? And that's the bookkeeper and accountant's job. And sometimes I can see, you know, construction companies put that off. The, the owner will do the books, but the owner's not an accountant. The owner may try to leverage and manage all of the incoming expenses, but they really don't have the time or the education to properly do that. So what they end up doing is getting their business to a Frankenstein level functionality. So they've kind of like pieced all of these things together to make it work, but they're not able to leverage the data effectively enough to control costs because the data that's being input is in some cases superficial, in other cases incomplete, and in some cases outright erroneous. So one of the first things you have to do when managing cost controls is making sure that you understand the inputs that are going into the system in the form of costs and that all of those costs are being broken down in the form of expenses, liabilities, long-term liabilities, and current liabilities, in other words, short-term liabilities. So that's kind of the, the 
framework and ground floor for cost control. Yeah, I think a lot of business, once you get out of that that startup stage, as you had talked about, and you start to move into, I'm a business, I'm growing this, but everything's still on your plate. Like that's just kind of, and I think a lot of it's that mentality. Like we spend this time trying to get out of startup stage. And when you're there, you're it, you're everything. It doesn't matter what kind of business you have from a consulting business to a construction business to anything is like, all you're trying to do is get to that where you have some breathing room. Mm -hmm. And then once you get there, there is a lot of stuff you do along the way that is just to kind of get it by just to make sure that you have it. And, you know, I know a lot of guys that just, they do the, they do the books at night or they do the, the job costing at night because they feel they're not ready to bring somebody on full time, which most of us aren't. I think that's one of the great things about this show is that I've been able to bring people on here and have a discussion around how you can have experts help you with your business without having to bring somebody on full time to help get you to that next level. How how do you recommend the guys start getting some of this stuff in order so they don't have such a Frankenstein or say they don't have anything? Say they're literally can't like they they've just whatever in it. Yeah. Yeah. And I've I've seen that. Like one of the toughest situations I saw was a company generating roughly half a million dollars in revenue and still being in debt. And and by debt, I mean not healthy debt, but like uncontrollable debt, debt where the interest rates are running away and the uh, the cost of maintaining the, the debt was escalating. So in those types of situations, what happened was the Frankenstein model was held on to too long. So what I recommend to people is that you have to understand when it's time to adjourn the old business model and team. So at my level, we see teams all the time and we build and break teams down. So there are five stages to professional team building, like in the entrepreneurial world and business world. And stage number one is forming. So you form the team. Stage number two is storming. The team collides and clashes and standards and expectations are revealed. Then you get to the norming stage. This is when standards and expectations are normalized and the culture begins to form. Then you get to the performing stage where everyone is operating as a well-oiled machine. Things are getting done well and you're getting results. And then you get to the adjourning stage. And that's when the team that was performing no longer performs at the level necessary for growth to continue, meaning the you've hit a point of diminishing returns. So at one point, this team was crushing it. They were getting things done. And the amount of time and money that was going into them was giving a return on investment that was responsible and acceptable. But there gets a point in the business where that team, the time energy and resources going to that team no longer produce the same degree of results, which means you've hit diminishing returns, which means it's time to adjourn that team and form a new one for the next level. So what a lot of people do is they hold on to their performing team longer than they should because they become comfortable and confident in the results of that performing team. So what most business owners have to be willing to do is break a good team because the a good team isn't the best team. And when you're bringing on consultants or CFOs like myself, you're usually going to have to reallocate resources, which means you're going to have to fire people. But that's okay because that's what we do. Like we operate at a certain level. When I come into a company, I bring taxes, accounting, finance, operational insights, and I bring so much with me. But I bring it with me at a level that you weren't able to get it when it was piecemeal together. So it's a completely different team that's performing now. And that's where the exponential growth comes from. 
Yeah. I mean, I, I think if you're not growing your team, you got to move on from them. like it, it, you can only do so much. You have to be willing to help them grow and they have to be willing to grow. And if you're going to that next level, they got to be able to go for that ride. And if they're not, a lot of times, you know, we just don't move on fast enough. Like you said, we just continue to hang on to it. You there? Yes, sir. I have no idea what just happened, but we're back in it. <laughs> All right. What's the last thing you heard? Because you might end up chopping in, uh, splicing this particular recording. Yeah, no. So, well, I'll just take off, right? Where if for everybody listening out there, you know, if this is a little bit whatever, uh, Zoom just completely shut down, but we're back at it. You know, I heard all the way through that and I started to respond. So I don't know if you mm -hmm. heard my response, but is that no. all too often we get to where, you know, we have to either the team has to grow with us. We have to be willing to train them give them an opportunity to grow but if they don't like we have to be able to pull the trigger on that to go to the next level we just can't settle in and be like yep these are the guys and girls that have always been here it's going to get us where we're going they that just doesn't long term get us to where we need to go you have to be willing to make the decisions to take your business where it needs to go yeah. And I, I'd like to add a, a piece to that before you ask the next question. And the the six figure to seven figure space is one that's very interesting because training people isn't the same as when you are an established business or and by established business, I mean, the most of you all might have had nine to fives and now you're entrepreneurs for yourself so when we say things like hey train this individual up and then see if they can come along with us something that's very distinctly different about the six-figure space is that you, you usually don't have employees normally you have contractors and if you have contractors vas or consultants you don't control enough of their time or enough of their activity while on the job and they're not working on the clock they're usually showing up executing and leaving so sustaining culture and maximizing culture is all very interesting stuff because you have now a bunch of consultants or a bunch of vas a bunch of contractors that you've used to build your business and now it's hard to let them go because you feel like they're an employee or you feel like they're a part of the team when in reality, they're not an employee, they have their own business and you have to be able to let them go so that you can hire employees. So I did want to throw that out there too, because sometimes we can have the employee paradigm trying to deal with employer things. In other words, we can have an employee perspective trying to handle employer level activity. So I did want to put that out there because I do see it and it's it's tough, you know, to let people go. Well, I think that's a good thing to talk about is having, you know, having an employee mindset when you're an employer. Like that is something that we uh, we fall into, like especially when you're talking about in that that beginning stage and getting something to seven figures, like you probably left your W-2 and started this out a year ago. And here you are trying to figure that out. And, you know, we deal with either subcontractors or mm -hmm. say you have consultants or, and it's time to bring on your own team. That can be intimidating in itself. And uh, I think we can have an employee mindset when it comes to this. And we have to look at it as where are we headed and what do we want to do? Like, does having a bunch of VAs or does having a bunch of subs, like, is that where we're headed? Or is this, do we want to have control over this? Why did we start this business? A lot of people started it because they wanted the control to be able to do it their way. Does having contractors and uh, subs and consultants do that for you? Like, I think that's a legit question people have to ask themselves. 
I know mm-hmm. guys that have grown their business to well deep in the seven, eight figures with a few employees and they sub everything out. Margins are completely different than if you build your whole team, but there's a different point to all of it. And you have to kind of decide what does that look like for you? Agreed. Agreed. And, you know, one thing you said that I found worth engaging in was the intimidation piece when it comes to hiring your own team. Payroll taxes can be quite intimidating because you go from 1099s to, okay, I've got my own employees and I've got to pay FICA taxes or at least my portion of it. I have to have a amount for unemployment taxes and then I have to pay employment taxes. It's almost like it's never ending at times. You just feel like one tax after the next and that can be intimidating as well. So another thing that is really important and that's why that fractional CFO space that I've gotten into has been as lucrative for us as it has been is because when we find those ideal fits, people that are like really strong in their business acumen and have the company that could go to seven figures and beyond, we are an exceptional tool for them. And we're an exceptional tool for them because there are certain things that just have to be bridged. You just have to bridge it. And when you bridge it, you have to be able to bridge it long enough to get to where you want to be. And that's, you know, our name, the name of this company is Iron Bridge Consulting Group. And we're Iron Bridge because that's the, that's the mindset. And those that have ever done like startups in the tech side of house, you're probably familiar with the term bridge round, and that's for funding. So you would have your initial, say, friends and family round, then you would have a seed round or pre-seed round, then you'd have a series A round. But leading up to a series A round, you might have a bridge round. And we call these bridge rounds because certain investors are looking for the company to have so much traction, so much cash flow, or so much potential at a certain stage of funding. And if you don't have those things in place at that stage where you're seeking funding, you need a bridge round in order to get you to one of those pre-qualification areas. And that's the same thing going from six to seven. And that's why I really am passionate about this because you can see it in the startup space, in the Fortune 500 Silicon Valley space, like the unicorns, like they understand the power of bridging. And you can also see it in the 3 million to 10, because that's where you can get some really nice exit multiples. So those individuals that are acquiring businesses and merging businesses and selling them and reverse merging them, they understand this very well. But it's the guys in the middle that aren't getting that TLC that they need to go from six figures to seven and really start paying themselves the salaries that they know they deserve. And I'll end with this six figures, like a quarter million dollars is not a lot of money when you are running the business as well. So what I mean, is like, you're probably taking home a salary of 50 to $60,000 if you're pulling in 20, uh, 250,000. So when we're talking about bringing in a million dollars in revenue, we're talking about really improving your standard of living because a six figure business is nothing but a high paying job. Mm -hmm. And most of us want to be established entrepreneurs, which is why I say I help take those six-figure owner-operated businesses and turn them into professionally managed seven-figure organizations so that you can become a stockholder, stakeholder, and business owner, and not just, say, the magic or the cog in the wheel that keeps things rolling. Awesome, man. I love it. Thank you for being on the show today. Absolutely. So if any of the construction champions out there wanted to get a hold of you, wanted to follow you, where's the best places for them to do that? Absolutely. You can go to my website at bobbyjacksoncfo.com. On my website, you can get to my Facebook. You can get to my LinkedIn. You can get anywhere you want to go from my website. So that, again, is Bobby with a Y. Bobby Jackson, CFO.com. Awesome, man. Once again, thank you for being on the show today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Ron. 
Anytime, man. All right, construction champions. Another fantastic episode where I think we had a lot of great look in the mirror questions. Like, where are you trying to go? What do you want to do? I love how he ended it with, you know, a 200, a, a six figure business is just a job. Like typically, and I've been at every level of different businesses and we had a cleaning company doing three, 400,000 a year. And we were growing that. And in the construction industry, I've been to eight figures and it is all different. The struggles are different when you're going from a few hundred thousand a year to a million, because you are doing a lot of the stuff yourself and trying to figure that out. Got to look in the mirror. What does that look like as you continue to grow that? Because the goal is to get out of a high paying job or to just make it paying the best you've ever been paid. That's why we start businesses is to go get that stuff done. So construction champions, until next time, be the champion you were meant to be. Hey, construction champions, it's your host, Ron Nussbaum here, and I want to talk to you about how you can automate all of your marketing. We've had so many people on here talk about getting the systems in place. Well, we have partnered with Build 12 and Construction Champions Podcast. Les O'Hara, the founder, what really excites me is his 30 years in the industry. And now he's built a system to be able to nurture your leads and continue to utilize that. I personally use the system myself. Build 12 is absolutely amazing. There's a lot of value in there. And it's a way to start getting away from Angie's list and all of that kind of stuff and start actually creating your own leads every day and have a system for them. So go on our website Check out the show notes. Go check out Build 12 and what it can do for the front end of your business today. It's absolutely amazing. I highly recommend going and meeting with Les and his son, Devin, and talking to him about what they built for their own business so the rest of the industry can take benefit from that. Here on Construction Champions, we're all about helping each other out. And what is better than contractors helping contractors? I say nothing. So let's go take this to the next level. Go check out Build 12. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or Les or his son, Devin. We're here to help. We want to continue to grow the industry.